Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be back. It's nice to be able to share the Word of God with you. I'm looking for my friends, and I see a bunch of them, but there's a family here that I don't see that might be sitting up in the back of there. If you're back there, you can hear me. I'm waving to you. Hello. I'm glad you're here. As we look at Romans, um, two weeks ago I preached, and I preached Christ our righteousness. The message that I want to share with you this morning, uh, no, excuse me, two weeks ago I preached Christ and His righteousness. This morning it's going to be Christ our righteousness. Um, <clears throat> turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, and I'll give you a little background on Christ and His righteousness before I start this morning. <coughs> Romans chapter 5, verse 1, saying, Therefore, having been, what's that word? Justified. justified. You know what that word justified means? Made right. Yeah. Made right? Straightened up. Straightened up. I like that. Listen, you are justified. And it's not you that has made yourself justified in God's sight. It is a gift that God has given to you. Amen. That in God's sight, when He looks at you, He sees you as straight up. You are justified as if you have never sinned before. Isn't that good news? Amen. That's why it's called the gospel. Okay, Because the gospel says that you are a sinner and cannot help yourself. And God loved you so much that He did all that you need to be saved. Amen. So... We are justified, meaning we are made right in the sight of God. God is not angry with you. God does not hate you. God loves you. And He shows that love, and this is what Paul talks about here. God demonstrated His love and that He gave His Son while we were still enemies of God. Now think about that. How many here would be willing to die for their enemies? How many here would be willing to give their child to die for their enemy? And yet that is what God has done for us. In giving us His Son, He demonstrated not just to sinners here, but to all the beings in the universe that God is love. Now, I've said this before, and I want you to think about this. Would you say that a human being is love? Now, we can love, we can show love, right? But we're not love. Do you understand? God is love. Yeah. You hear that, you hear that, and it goes, well, it doesn't really do anything for me. But I want you to think about it. You know how to love, you know how to show love, but you're not love. That is the essence of our God. And God has shown this love and demonstrated it to the entire universe by giving us His Son and justifying a lost world that can never save themselves. That, brothers and sisters, is the gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen? That's the good news, what Jesus Christ has done for us. So looking at Romans chapter 5, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have what? Peace. So understand that you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now listen, this life can bring you joy. This life can bring you good days. can bring you happy memories. This life can also bring you sadness can bring you sickness. The one thing that this life will give every one of us if we last long enough is death, right? Death. That you at some point will be separated from the ones you love. Either they will die or you will die. Was death part of God's plan? No. Death is an enemy. It was never part of what God had intended. And so death had to be conquered, and it had to be overcome. Now how do you plan to overcome death? Because brothers and sisters, it's going to overcome you. How do you plan on overcoming it? In this flesh, outside of Christ, 
There is no way to overcome death. They have no power against it. But do you understand that because Christ died for you, you now have power over death in Him? Amen. Amen. Verse 5, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been what? Has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ did what? He died for the ungodly. Paul writes this, and this is still true today. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps even for a good man someone would even dare to die. Verse 8, this is the key. But God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were still what? Sinners. Sinners. Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God, still in our sin, Christ died for us. Well, you say, well, listen, Christ died 2,000 years ago. How does that affect me? Before this world was created, did God know who you were? Yeah. Yeah. Was God able to see your face? Yeah. Yeah. Do you understand that God is able to see the past, the present, and the future as one? Yeah. There's no difference with Him. He can look 10,000 years in the past, He can look 10,000 years in the future, and it's all the same. He knows what's going to happen, He knows what has happened, and so when God made this world, and when He looked fresh into the face of Adam and Eve, He saw you. All their offspring. And do you realize that when Adam and Eve both sinned, again, He saw you and I. And He realized that unless He stepped in, there would be no hope for us. We would never be able to overcome sin or death, and we would be lost for eternity. So God had a plan. That plan involved the giving of His Son, and that His Son would take your punishment and my punishment. Let's turn to verse 16 of Romans chapter 5. you got to love this, because God calls what He did a gift. Why is it called a gift? Any ideas? It's not rhetorical. You're a lot actually in this room. <laughs> You don't get sent out of the room. But he didn't have to do it. He didn't have to do it. But why is it called a gift, Matt? He didn't do anything to deserve it. Say it loud. We didn't do anything to deserve it. We didn't do anything to deserve it. Let me ask you, Mark. We can't do anything to repay it. You owe a debt, right? Yeah. And it's a debt that you can never repay. And God did something for you that you don't deserve. This is the family I was talking about. Right. Sierra, children, it's good to see you. <clears throat> Sierra, how old is this one? It'll be six. I'm glad you're here. It's good to see you. You can see your dad. Um, what God has done for us, and why He calls it a gift, like Max said, is because... We don't deserve it. And so a gift is something that is given. Now let me ask you a question. As you think about this, did this cost God anything to give us this gift? Yeah. Yeah. Priceless. <coughs> Priceless, right? We don't really think about this. We think about what Jesus endured on the cross. What did it cost the Father and what did it cost the Holy Spirit to give this gift to humanity? Any ideas? Can't put a value. I want you to think about this, and we talked about this before. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. Is that right? Mm -hmm. But yet they're three. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Don't think about it too hard, you'll get a headache and you'll have to walk out of here. But being one means that they think, feel, act, and would do the same thing. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, right? <laughs> Jesus also said the Spirit will come and He won't talk about Himself, but He will continue to show you me, Jesus Christ, right? What Jesus endured, the Father endured. 
What Jesus endured, the Spirit endured. Now, was there ever from eternity past to the birth of Jesus any separation within the Godhead? No. no. What happened on the cross when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Separation. Do you realize that wasn't just Jesus being separated from his Father, that was all three of them being separated. What Jesus felt, the Father felt, and what Jesus felt, the Spirit felt. Do you realize that the only saved... Well, let me figure out how I'm going to express this. Put it another way. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you never have to taste hell, do you realize that Jesus throughout all of eternity will be the only one alive that ever went through hell? And know what it's like? And He'll keep that through eternity? And He did it for you? When Jesus died on the cross, which death did He die? Did He die because His heart exploded? And is there a difference between the first death, which is what we die when we get old, get run over by a car, <laughs> get cancer? Right? Jesus died the second death. Is that right, Ricky? Yeah. Yeah. And what death was that? That's the death that <coughs> sinners will die. That is eternal separation from God. That's why it's called hell. Because God's presence is nowhere to be found. And when Jesus felt that on the cross... This is what took his life. Let me ask you a question. There was a thief that was nailed to the cross on his left side and on his right side. Is that right? Did they die at the same time he did? Yes. No. They had actually come and break their legs to hasten death. I bring this to you to let you know that it wasn't the nails in their wrists or their feet that killed Christ. The soldiers were shocked that he was dead already. Right? <laughs> to make sure they stuck a spear inside. And what came out? Water. Blood and water. Do you know why blood and water came out? Because his heart exploded. And the reason for that was because of what he endured on the cross. Do you remember in the Gospels, it tells you that at a certain hour, darkness came upon the face of the land and you couldn't see Jesus? Yeah. Do you know why? It's because the Father didn't want people looking on Him at what He endured because He was paying for your sins and my sins. Amen. And the anguish that it caused Him was so great that the Father set that call on Him. Now listen. He did that for His enemies. Amen. Can you imagine what it's like to be His friend? What he offers you, this world just looks at and discards. I don't want it. I don't want it. When Jesus died, he died for how many? For God so loved the world. You're going to find in these sets of verses that we're going to read that God reconciled the world unto himself. Okay, we're not predestination believers here. Predestinarians, that's a big word. God died so that every person who lives on the face of the earth has the opportunity to be saved. And that God has reconciled the world to himself. And that reconciliation comes through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's go back and read these verses. Romans 5, verses 16. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from how many offenses? Many, many offenses. You understand what's being said here? Listen, how many sins did it take to get us into this condition that we're in? One. 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 The fall of Adam. And the fall of Eve, the mother and the father of all humanity, only had to commit one act of disobedience. Do you understand why the Bible says that the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, this is why I brought out 
in the beginning that God is love because you have to reconcile this, that God has the right to destroy those who are disobedient to Him. Do you know why He has that right? People who don't know God look at God and they go, He's a bully or He's a tyrant. But God understood what would happen if sin was allowed to reign anywhere. Look at the world today. Are we a peaceful people? Are we a morally good people? <coughs> Will we always do the right thing? Right. So can you imagine if that wasn't just here on this one small planet, but if that was allowed to spread throughout the entire universe? Disobedience to God isn't about God being a dictator or a tyrant. It is about knowing what love really is. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Satan and all the angels that follow him want to be destroyed? No. You ever think that maybe they think sometimes if they could go back and do the whole thing over again, they might have done something different? If you were an angel and you were created to live forever and never die, and now because you disobeyed, you are going to have an end. There's going to come a point in time where God's going to say, this is enough. You're going to have to reap the consequences of what you sow. Does God have the right to pass judgment on those who disobey Him? Do you know why? The answer to that is because God is love. Everything that God does is done out of love. So when God punishes, when God allows people or angels to reap what they sow, it's done out of love. This is why it tells you in Romans that God demonstrates His love in giving us His Son while we were still sinners, enemies with God. Because if we were sinners, what did we deserve? We deserve the punishment of a sinner, and that is death, separation from God. Why is it that a fallen human being cannot look on the face of God? What would happen to that human being? When Moses said to God, let me see your glory, and God said, okay, but there's conditions here. What was the condition? Uh, Say it loud, because you're right. Uh, hide in the cleft of the rock. Why did Moses have to be put in the cleft of the rock? Is it God's glory would it consume him? That's right. We already talked about this last week, right? But what I want you to understand is, wasn't Moses a good man? I mean, that was God's chosen vessel to liberate his people. The Bible says he was the humblest man who ever lived. But was Moses perfect? No. no. Moses sinned, and because he sinned, he needed a Savior. Amen. And he needed this God who could save him, and he could not look upon this God because this God is holy and just and perfect. And God cared so much about Moses... And he cared so much for these Israelites that he showed Moses this glory. Do you know why Moses asked him that? Do you know what took place before Moses asked him to show me your glory? Anybody? Think yeah, about it. He asked him to go save his people. The whole calf experience. <laughs> they were worshiping the golden calf. And God said specifically to Moses, I'm going to destroy them and I'll make a nation out of you. Right. And Moses talked with God as a man talks with a friend. And Moses said, don't do that. If you destroy them, destroy me with them. Mm -hmm. And God said, okay, I'll give them another chance. And Moses wanted to, and what God said is, okay, I'll give them another chance, but I'm not going to go with them. The angel of the Lord will go before them. And Moses said, no, we need you. And Moses wanted God's assurance that he would still be with his people. And Moses said, show me your glory. Mm. 
Because I know if you show me your glory, then I know that your glory will be with your people. And that's why Moses asked him that question. Did you know that? So listen, as we get back here to Romans, verse 16, the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, that's Adam, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses results in, here's that word, what's that word? Justification. Justification, being made right with God. Verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life. Why is there abundance of grace in Jesus Christ? Again, if you go back to the book of Romans, it tells you that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound, right? I want you to understand this. This is what righteousness by faith is all about. This is why it's Christ, our righteousness. We can never produce righteousness. Amen. The kind that God wants. I can do right things, and in your view, and in my view, I can do good things, right? Mm -hmm. I can help people. I can talk nicely to them. I can meet their needs. But without a change of heart and character, in God's sight, I'm still lacking. Mm -hmm. And I will always be lacking what God requires. So God understood that, and God gives me the righteousness of His Son. Do you understand why Jesus came and lived a perfect life? It's not that I go to God when I get to heaven and go, you have to let me in because look at my life. If I was to do that, God would, before I even got a word out, say, look at your life, and I'd have to bow my head and turn away because I know that I don't deserve to be here. Amen. But what I can do is when Satan, the accuser of the brethren, brings up all of my past, and all of my sin, all I have to do is hold the hand of my Savior and draw close to Him, and I don't have to say a word. Not a word. Amen. Do you know why? What does an advocate do? He speaks for you. He speaks for me. I have to just learn to shut my mouth and let Him speak, and Jesus will take care of Everything, right? So this justification I'm hearing means that there isn't a sin that God can't forgive. Exactly. And the other thing I'm hearing you say about love is that God, love is not an attribute of God, like it would be with us, but it, it, it's the very fiber of who He is. Yes, it's the personification of God. God is love. Mm -hmm. Now listen, why don't you think about this? If you were an angel and you got to stand in the presence of God and you got to stand in the presence of love and that love surrounded you, encompassed you and as a messenger of God you were able to bring that kind of love to others. Why do you think the Bible tells you that Satan appears as an angel of love? Where'd she go? <laughs> You're going one way, she's going the other. No. <laughs> so let me tell you, when I first came here to the church, we didn't, I don't think we had any kids. Right? We love children. Yeah. We love quiet children. We love noisy children. We love children. So please, bring children. <laughs> Those of you who have children, you know that when you come to a church and all you see are people without children or older people, usually you don't stay, right? Because you're going to go to a place that has children. So we want children. So like I said, it's a small place, but listen, I don't care if they're noisy, I don't care if they speak, and I let you speak better. Right? There you go. You're better. Let's go back to our verses. Verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteousness, or righteous act, the free gift comes to... What's that next word? All. Now, those of you who have the King James and the New King James, is that word all in a talus? 
in italics? No. 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 Okay, so that means that that's in the original language. Amen. When God gave His Son, He gave His Son to justify the entire world. That if you accept this gift, you can have salvation. Okay? It is for all men. Now, does that mean that all men will be saved? When God created Adam and Eve, did He create them with freedom to choose? Yes. Why? Don't you think it would have been a whole lot easier if He just pre-programmed them to do the right thing every time? <laughs> and ready, that is the key, because God is love. Why do you think God created anything in the first place? Because love has to be expressed. Right? Now listen. The ultimate love and the highest order and depth of love is what's found between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Right? That's a love we can't fathom or grasp in this life. But yet, see, that love wasn't enough. They had so much love, they needed to show it to more living things. And so God created angels. And that wasn't enough. And so God created angels other intelligent beings. Us being one of them. Sometimes I look and I wonder just how intelligent we are, the way the world works. But listen, what God created, God loves. And He created it so that we can show love back to Him. Right? My mother asked me one day, why does God need all this adoration and praise? See, she was looking at it from a human standpoint. Um, Usually people with very large egos need to have adoration and praise. And, and they turn out to be tyrants or dictators, right? But God isn't like that. God wants adoration and praise because God is love. And love has to be expressed. And not only do you express it, but you want it back. Is that right? A relationship, is it a one-way street? Our relationship is a two-way street. We, let me rephrase that, God loves us, and He gives us the opportunity to love Him back. Right? And because it's a two-way street, we can actually have a real relationship with this invisible God who we can't see. That's why God is spiritual, and the things He talks about are spiritual. So, verse 19 for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounds, what? Grace. Grace abounded much more. Do you know that, that verse, that yeah. sentence? Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Brothers and sisters, you who have claimed the name of Jesus Christ, I want you to memorize this verse because as you're dealing with your brothers and sisters inside the church, remember this verse. Because you're not coming in here to get away from sin because it's a place filled with sinners. Is that right? But where sin abounds, what? Grace does much more abound. This is why we are to love one another. Now, when Jesus said, you will know them by their love they have for each other, was he talking about our love for the world or our love for the brethren? Love for the brethren. Our love for the brethren. That needs to be different. And it has to be different than your love for the world and those who are out in it. Do you know why? Because you and your brethren are the ambassadors for Christ. And if you can't love each other, how are you going to love them? Yeah. Right? can't get along here, you're definitely not going to get along out there, and you want to bring them into your dysfunction? <laughs> so listen, what Christ has done for us is that He has given us the opportunity to be the temples of the living God. Mm -hmm. Now back in the days of Moses, and in the history of Israel, when they wanted to go and stand in the presence of God, where did they go? Temple. Say it loud, because you're right. To the temple. They went to the temple, right? This is why you had all of the ceremonies 
and that so many times a year you had to go down to the temple. Why? Because that's where the presence of God was. It was in the most holy place. Is that right? So what happened in 70 AD? The temple was destroyed. Is that right? So where do you go now? Is it the church where God's presence is? No. You are the temple of the living God. The Holy Spirit.